Would you want your daughter to be a coal miner? A woman can't be a coal miner. It's just not right. You want a woman taking a man's job? It's just no place for a woman. Besides that, they just can't do the work. And anyway, it's just too dangerous for a woman. A woman underground is just plain bad luck. These are all quotations taken from interviews and newspaper articles in the 1970s, because it wasn't until 1974 that women were officially hired to work in underground coal mines in the US. And it wasn't just social mores and superstitions. There were laws preventing women from taking this line of work. And that's had a lasting impression on what we think of coal mining today. Now, you may have heard those voices and thought, that's just old-fashioned thinking. That's outdated. But I'm willing to bet that if I asked you to picture a coal miner right now, the first image that would pop into your mind might be something like this, a man covered in coal mine dust. But in reality, women have had a role in coal mining for over 200 years. We see here women in England in 1900 working at the surface of a coal mine. They're wearing long skirts over their work pants. And prior to the 1840s, women and children mined coal underground. But when legislators heard of their hard labor, they created laws prohibiting women and children from working in underground coal. And these same paternalistic protection laws inspired US legislators to follow suit. So that by 1932, there were 17 states that had laws prohibiting women from working in underground coal. Now, of course, during times of war, women were expected to pitch in as part of their patriotic duty. And we see women in Wyoming here in 1942 doing just that. But perhaps the most enduring image of women in coal is the role of the hardworking coal miner's wife, devoted to her husband, taking care of the children, keeping everyone clean, clothed, and fed. Wives, mothers, and daughters of the coal camps were instrumental in supporting the men and supporting the union during times of strike. And this article from 1900 describes the anthracite coal strike and quotes the president of the union, uh, John Mitchell, describing the wives of coal miners as a crucial tool in a successful strike. And I couldn't talk to you about women in coal mining without also mentioning Mother Jones, who's seen here tending to the children of coal miners in West Virginia in 1912. And she was better known as a fiery spokesperson for the union, an agitator, and a friend of coal miners everywhere. And recommended viewing for anybody who hasn't seen it yet is this documentary, award-winning Harlan County, USA. And it depicts life in a coal mining town in Kentucky during a 1973 strike. It provides a stirring example of the role of women in the community supporting unionization efforts. But it was around this time in the 60s and 70s that women were tired of just being in the background, fed up with just playing a supporting role in the lives of men. Across the country, divorce rates were increasing, and they're increasing choices for women, leading to greater independence. The 1964 Civil Rights Act was intended to abolish discriminatory hiring practices on the part of the US government and its contractors. And the 1967 amendment added gender as a basis for non-discrimination. <clears throat> Women were going from being homemakers and bread bakers to breadwinners. But it still wasn't until 1974 that a consent decree forced the US steel industry to hire women to work in their underground coal mines. Now, today's theme is moving mountains. And I'll tell you about women who've done just that. The first women hired to work in an underground coal mine were Anita and Diana. They're both former hospital workers. And you see them here, about to start their shift, going underground to move mountains, digging Appalachian coal, and proving their ability to work alongside the men. And they look proud to be coal miners. But just because the laws were changing didn't mean that the culture around coal mining would transform overnight. There were still superstitions in place, including the idea that the presence of a woman underground would cause disaster to strike. So in 1977, in Tennessee, there was an environmental group that wanted to take a tour of an underground coal mine. This is a group made up of a number of men and one woman. And when they called the coal mine owner to set up the tour, he told them bluntly, I can't have a woman going underground. The men would walk out. The mine would shut down. Now, if you fellows want to come take a tour, that's one thing. But if you insist on bringing her, forget the whole thing. 
Well, you can imagine, this set off a chain reaction. Once it hit the desk of Betty Jean Hall, a lawyer formerly from Kentucky, who became the first director of this advocacy group, the Coal Employment Project, which included among their goals bringing legislation against coal mine owners refusing to hire women. Because Betty Jean saw a need. There were women in Appalachia who wanted these jobs in mining, and they were going to have to fight discrimination to get them. The kind of discrimination where jobs were posted at the mine, but in the men's bathhouse where women just didn't have access. And if women found out about these jobs and applied anyways, their applications were just going ignored. Now, of course, these women didn't have prior experience working in underground coal, but, and again, neither did most of the men who were being hired to do the work. So when women wanted to complain to the mine owners, they were told, well, we can't hire just one woman. So on top of the tremendous effort bringing legislation and legislative cases against these mine owners, Betty Jean and her staff developed workshops to prepare women to work in coal mines. These workshops included assertiveness training, introducing women to tools of the trade, and providing helpful advice. So when you go to apply for a job at a coal mine, bring a friend with you, because if there's more than one woman going underground together, then there's safety in numbers. Because even though a woman could get past the barrier of being hired to work in a coal mine, it didn't mean that she would be accepted by her new colleagues, let alone respected. Now, as I was digging through the archives of the Coal Employment Project, I came across headlines. Headlines detailing cases that were brought to the courts in the 70s. And that gives you an idea of the kind of harassment that women faced at the time. And these are just the incidents that made it into the papers. So after looking through all that, you may be wondering, well, why would women want to work under these kinds of conditions? Well, you remember Anita and Diana, the first women hired to work underground. Well, they made twice what they had been making as hospital workers once they started mining coal. Another new miner, hired around the same time, described her previous job waitressing where she worked six days a week for $40 pay. In Appalachia, women working outside the home at the time were making on average less than $1.60 an hour. But jobs in coal mining were starting at about $50 a day. A new woman miner hired in 1976 said, we should have more women in mining. The more women we have, the more support we get. And if we show that women can mine coal, then other jobs that have been closed to us, that pay well, that women have never been able to get, will start opening up for us. My wages will upgrade other women's wages. We're not satisfied with low pay at shirt factories anymore. Well, now that women can be hired to work as coal miners, are we satisfied now? Well, we know that women still don't have equal representation in underground coal mining. When I asked you to picture a coal miner and you imagined it as primarily the domain of men, well, you're still not wrong. Over 90% of underground coal miners in the US today are men. So if those women in the 70s breaking into the industry didn't make a lasting change in the face of coal mining, does it mean that we've failed because we don't have more women mining today? No. Women didn't take those jobs just because they pictured their daughters or their daughters' daughters someday mining coal, too. They took those jobs to provide for their children, to provide a better future for their families, working towards that classic American dream of giving their children a better, easier life than they had. And we know the times have changed. In the 1960s, it would have been absurd to picture a woman as a coal miner, just as it would have been absurd to picture a woman as an airline pilot or a surgeon. Male-dominated industries have opened up to include women. There are jobs and careers available to us today that were just impossible to imagine just over 50 years ago. But what we can take away, what we can learn from these trailblazing women in coal is the spirit of working together to fight for change. To not take no for an answer when it's a no that's keeping you from achieving your potential. And we know that there's still a long way to go. We sit here, we can acknowledge that we've come so far, but there's still so much farther to go. There's still more change to keep striving for. The kind of change that's about more than just making sure women can be hired to work alongside the men. 
the kind of change that's about ensuring women are supported throughout their careers and throughout their lives. That means extending access to parental leave and ensuring affordable childcare is available. Because unfortunately, we're still battling a gendered pay wage gap today. The US Census Bureau showed that in 2022, white women earned only 84% of what white men earned. And if we're talking about black women, that goes down even lower, 70% of what white men earned. Hispanic women, 65%, and Native American women, 55%. So these issues of women's employment, it is about feminism, it is about politics. But if you were to go back in time to the 1970s and ask these women breaking into coal, they would have told you that for them, at its core, it was about the ability of women to be able to support themselves and their families. A woman interviewed for the documentary Coal Mining Women, she was mining in Harlan County, Kentucky in 1980, said, well, I don't know that I'm making history, I'm just making a good living. Women today deserve to have the ability to earn enough to support themselves and their families, to stand on their own two feet with dignity. We have the choices and the opportunities available to us now to get ourselves there. And we have women like these to thank for it. Thank you. <laughs>